right. Well, welcome back. We are jumping into our second session on Revelation chapter 6. Last session was a bit of review of a lot of information. We've covered over a lot of different uh, addenda type series we've done over the course of 2020. Uh, as I said, the reason we pulled back to, to do those was because I would have had to teach all of that stuff in detail prior to, to working our way through the actual text here. So now you've got this library, whether it's a few sessions on Daniel 9 or it's a couple of sessions on the Olivet Discourse or it's the sessions we did on the Rapture or any of those things. You've got this library you can go back to when I call back to some of that information and educate yourself in, at your own leisure um, to really understand at a deeper level some of the principles and the topics that that I'm opening up as we go through the actual text. And, and hopefully you can see how that's been demonstrated. Now, at the end of uh, Revelation chapter 5, we did give you some homework. And, uh, you know, especially if you're watching this back online and, and not live, uh, you know, here's, here's where you want to be. You want to have read Daniel 9. You want to have had gone through the two sessions we did on the 70 weeks of Daniel and made yourself familiar with that prophetic text, specifically Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And then, of course, you want to read Revelation chapter 6 and understand the opening of those scrolls. We're going to deal with, out of the six seals on the seven sealed scroll that that are opened in Revelation chapter 6. We're going to deal with the uh, first four in this session. So, um, one of the principles uh, that we talked about in the last session was this sequence of events, this key events that the 24 elders and the seven lampstands are in heaven when the tribulation begins. That means the rapture uh, has been heavily implied by the scripture to have taken place. The lamb doesn't receive the scroll until after the 24 elders place their crowns on the glassy sea. The 24 elders are, of course, the church. Ergo, the church is in heaven inside the holy of holies of the universe when the lamb receives the scroll. He receives the scroll because the church is his bride. The scroll is a Jewish marriage contract and one part of the Jewish bridegroom's responsibility as a goel is to take his bride to redeem her and to redeem what her inheritance possesses. And that, that, is, that is part of what Jesus is doing there. The tribulation doesn't begin until the lamb opens the first seal. So we talked about the very traditional um, view of the 70th week of Daniel, the last seven years known as the Great Tribulation, that it is often discussed as beginning in Revelation 6 and going through Revelation 19, uh, the 70th week of Daniel in the red on the timeline. At the end of that interval that Daniel implies and that Jesus talks about. But we discussed that the seven sealed scroll is really the first in a series of sevens that take place. And when we get to the trumpets, I'll probably introduce this a bit more. Uh, but it's worth noting, and I'm trying to find it here. Uh, One second. So Leviticus 26, I don't have this one for you, but I want you to see this. Leviticus 26, 18 is describing the judgments that will come upon Israel if they, if they don't obey the covenant that they are under. And in Leviticus 26, 18 it says, And after this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Interestingly enough, 
Leviticus 26 to go on, goes on to use phraseology like that three more times. In other words, there's a cascading series of sevens for refusal to obey under judgment that leads to seven more judgments. Basically, what we're seeing happen is the seven sealed scroll leads to seven more judgments, the seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets lead to seven more judgments, the seven bowl judgments. There's precedent for that in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, because we see that if Israel doesn't repent, and that is the purpose of a lot of these judgments, to get Israel to repent. In fact, we saw that back here in Hosea 5.15. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face in their affliction. They will earnestly seek me. That's the point of what we're kind of witnessing in this place, these seven judgments that are taking place, and they cascade into the trumpets, into the bowls. And that may be linked to what God is talking about there, about if you do not repent, I will punish you seven more times. So just know that there's a scriptural precedence for that. Here's what we're going to be looking at. The seven sealed scroll, what are the seven seals and what happens when they are opened? Well, the first six seals happen to correspond to a group of signs that Jesus, in effect, says are non-signs. He calls them the beginning of sorrows, and he mentions them in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew and Mark and his slightly different discourse in Luke, and they deal with false, false Christs, wars, famines, deaths, martyrs, and global chaos. And because Jesus says these are non-signs, in fact, because in places like Matthew 24, 6, he says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are tr not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. We submit to you that it is possible that these signs, the beginning of sorrows and the first six seals may not actually be the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel or the seven year countdown to the return of Christ known as the time of Jacob's trouble or the great tribulation, but rather that there may be a gap that takes place. And I provided you with some information both online and uh, here to the people that are here today for you to look at the evidences that exist that a gap between the beginning of the end and the actual start of the uh, 70th week of Daniel may be may be a period of indeterminate length between the rapture and the conducting of the Bema Seat Judgment and, of course, the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, which corresponds to a period of seven years. And we saw that the Bible even confirms in Genesis 29, 27, that the, the Bridal Supper wasn't just one slow feast. It was a week. The bride got a week to spend in uh, the consummation of the marriage with the bridegroom. And uh, that, that is a very, very interesting thing. For people who don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, that's difficult because the bride comes back with Christ when he returns to the earth. So if the church has to meet Jesus in the air and then land with him to reign and rule with him at the return of Christ. That's a problem. It turns that seven-week feast into essentially a fast food value meal lunch. I don't think Jesus, having waited so long for his bride, is going to be content to expedite. that. You know, Jesus, isn't, Jesus doesn't strike me as the type of groom who wants a Vegas marriage. I think he's going to make the most of it. Uh, I'm saying... To faster than seven years is Vegas. I'm saying he doesn't want to rush it. That's, that's what I'm saying. The next slides will illustrate how my jokes work. Um, so let's talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Very often duplicated into popular myth, popular in comics, popular in movies, uh, often used by Hollywood, misunderstood by all, but sadly, many times, especially the first one, misunderstood by Bible commentators. And while we may be able to forgive Hollywood for not understanding the Word of God, I think we need to be a little bit more stringent on the discernment that we apply to biblical scholars. First, 
as we always do, let's take a look at the outline of this chapter. Remember, I'm trying to teach you that outlining the biblical text in your personal study time is good for you. It helps you grasp the material. So what do we see? Verses 1 through 2 deal with the first seal, otherwise known as the white horse. Verses 3 through 4 deal with the second seal, otherwise known as the red horse. Verses 5 through 6 deal with the third seal, otherwise known as the black horse. Verses 7 through 8 deal with the fourth seal, otherwise known as, everybody make the quotes with me, the green horse. You're going to see why we do that in a minute. Some, some translations call him the pale horse. Why, why is there uh, some uh, quibbling over what color this horse is? Is John colorblind? No, we're just not very good at linguistics. Verses 9 through 11 show us the fifth seal, martyrs beneath the altar. And 12 through 14 show us the sixth seal, which is cosmic upheaval. Verses 15 through 17, interestingly, shows us the reaction to all of this chaos that the kings of the earth show when all of this starts happening. In this session this morning, we will get through the fourth seal. We will save the fifth seal, the sixth seal, and the reaction of the kings of the earth for one more session. Now, a storm is brewing. We're going to take a look for a moment. I want to, I want to kind of put in your mind a picture of what man says uh, versus what God said. And then, of course, what you want to do is ask yourself who is right. And, and the reason that I say that is some Bible commentators, some views believe that, the, the, that all the, the, the talk about the church becoming apostate, the world becoming worse and worse and worse, all of those kind of things, they they have a different view of eschatology. They view the church as going to become the most powerful force on the planet prior to the return of Christ. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people who teach that kind of eschatological view are in the charismatic Pentecostal camp. So as charismatic, Pentecostal, spirit-filled, authority-walking, power-believing Christians such as we are, we will find ourselves coming into contact with folks that have different eschatological views than us. And sadly, many everyday pew-sitting, church-attending, uh, Beth Moore Bible study enjoying Christians don't understand that a lot of their teachers, and I'm not saying she has those views, but you know, that's light and happy and fun and doesn't get into anything deep. Um, a lot of those Christians, they don't understand what their favorite teachers actually believe when it comes to eschatology, uh, because eschatology is not taught within the church. I interacted with a pastor just a little while ago, they put up a, a scripture verse on their Facebook page, and I just said, what translation is this? And they told me, and then I went and I looked, and it was a translation that was uh, from people that were involved in the New Apostolic Reformation and people who follow these eschatological beliefs. And I was immediately able to discern and understand why their translation of the text was so bizarre compared to anything that we would read. And I asked the pastor, I said, are you aware of who these people are? Well, no. Are you aware of what their doctrinal beliefs are concerning the end times? No. I said, do you believe that the church is going to become apostate like the Bible says? Or do you believe that it's going to become better and better? He says, well, of course it's going to become apostate. I said, why are you quoting out of a Bible that is written by people that believe differently? than Well, I didn't know. So sometimes it's not the teacher's fault. The problem is deep things are not fun to get into. Uh, it's not happy little stories. It takes effort on the part of both the speaker to do the research and the audience to apply themselves. And that's why it's not done. So man tells us that the world is getting better. God says that it will become increasingly worse. Man says that peace among nations is close at hand. And even in recent months and weeks, we may be tempted to see that peace is is coming. God says there will be wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom. Man expects to win the battle against disease, famine, and hardship. Boy, do we understand that struggle in 2020. And God says there 
is to be fearful judgments of disease, famine, and hardship. Now with that, I present the caveat. We've already proven many times in this church that God didn't send COVID-19. COVID-19 isn't a judgment from God. All of the judgments that we are talking about take place after the church is out of here. Because John 5, 22, John 12, 47 through 48, they teach us that judgment is appointed for one day, the last day, the day of the Lord, which we talked about as being a very specific period of time in the last chapter. That's why all of these judgments can happen during that period, because Jesus said it would happen during that period. But until that period comes, Jesus says, I don't judge even unbelievers. We want to keep that in our focus because a lot of commentators miss that too. So with that groundwork laid, let's dive into the first seal, the great deception. And I've tried to find illustrations that, that give you pictures of what the text says to kind of solidify it in your mind as we go. <clears throat> Revelation 1, or I'm sorry, Revelation 6 verse 1. Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. Again, I want to point out to you a, a systematic thing you're going to see in Revelation from now on. Every time something happens in heaven and John needs an explanation of what is going on, it's one of the 24 elders that tells him. Every time something happens on earth and John needs an explanation of what's going on, it's one of the living creatures that tells him. That is a very subtle but unbreakable chain throughout the rest of the book of Revelation. So, so therefore, you can see who's, who's giving him the instruction here. Is it an elder or a living creature? So where is the action taking place? In heaven or on earth? I'm just trying to show you how you can figure out what's going on in the text, okay? And the creature said with a voice like thunder, come and see. John is really bearing witness to these future events. This isn't just a dream. He's seeing it with his own eyes. Come, it means, or er, in the Greek it is erkomai. It means proceed or follow. Come, visit this place, be here. To come from one place to another, used of persons arriving Revelation 6, 2. And I looked and behold a white horse. He sat on it and had a bow and a crown given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. So let's talk for a minute about the rider of the white horse. You see, the first of the seals to be opened ushers forth great deception. A lot of people focus on the aspect of this, this horse that describes him as a conqueror. But the real question is, how does he conquer? He conquers by deceiving. And it's interesting that even many commentators get fooled as to the identity of who the rider of this white horse is. And you'll see that at the end of this session. Because many biblical commentators say this is Christ. Because Christ rides a white horse. This is not Christ because Christ is the one opening the seals. He's not inside them. You with me? Moreover, what was the first sign of the beginning of sorrows? False Christs. So if prophecy is pattern and we're following the pattern, false Christs are the first thing that we should see. So it, is, it should not shock us that we see a rider who is not Christ, but who is upon a white horse. You with me? not to the end of the book that we see Jesus on a white horse. Now, horses in the biblical text equals judgments. In fact, when God is pronouncing judgment upon Israel, it is often 
the, the horses of the invading armies are often used to describe how they will run roughshod over the land and take what Israel has as its own. Horses in the first century and in centuries BC, the more horses an army had, the more powerful an army was. You understand? Okay. There were even pre prohibitions against the king of Israel keeping too many horses because, because the king of Israel was to rely on God to protect them, not his own might. Horses begin to speak of judgments in all kinds of verses. And you can look at some of those verses for yourself. As always, still images of these slides will be in the comments of the video. So you can pull them up on Facebook or YouTube and, and, uh, and see them for yourselves. Now, the other thing that is described about this white horse rider, this first rider that confuses so many commentators, so many commentators, is his crown. And if you just understand the Greek, you can begin to see that there's a, there's a falsehood even here. The term in the Greek is Stephanos. In other words, it's a victor's crown. It's the kind of crown that is promised to the church in different places when the promise to the overcomer was, was a crown of life, a crown uh, of um, various different things in chapters 2 and 3. And a Stephanos was like the laurel wreath, right, given to the winners of the original Olympics. Not a diadem. A diadem was a kingly crown. And when we see Christ with his crown upon his head, the Greek is different. Christ is wearing a diadem, not a Stephanos. He is a king in full authority. Okay? And so the fact that this guy is conquering, he's winning, that's a victor's crown. And we see Christ wearing his diadem in Revelation 19, 12. Now, Here's another reason we should be able to tell that it's not Christ. What's his weapon? It's a bow. Well, Christ's weapon is always the sword of the Spirit. We see that in Revelation 19.15. The sword comes out of his mouth. Ephesians 6.16. Matthew 10.34. The sword of the Spirit is always Christ's weapon throughout Bible, the Bible. And idioms are consistent. So this guy has a bow. He has darts and arrows. Who, who, who in the Bible is described as having fiery darts? Anybody? Do you see how the theory of expositional constancy makes it easy to interpret the symbols? The fact that symbols are consistent from Genesis to Revelation and they don't change their meaning throughout the Bible can make you a good biblical interpreter if that's the only rule that you know. It's not, you don't randomly start interpreting things and then making stuff up based on what you want it to mean. What are the symbols? What do they mean? The Bible defines it for you and that's how we come up with our interpretation. Shouldn't be about what my unique vision from the Lord is. Okay? It's a bow. Now, this could be, in effect, a symbol of Nimrod the hunter. There are good commentators, I happen to agree with most of them, that believe that this is the Antichrist making his first appearance in the book of Revelation. But, again, don't think that we have to be immediately in the tribulation because of that, because it will take, when the rapture takes place, it will take time to establish control over all of the world. In fact, what it says is there will be 10 kings and he will subdue three of them and take leadership. And, and there's all kinds of stuff that has to happen in the tribulation period. But it isn't necessarily unbiblical to sit there and say that there is an indeterminate time ahead of time where he kind of comes on the scene. Now, I'm not, believe me, you join the rapture groups, you're going to hear all kinds of people who are the Antichrist. Trump's the Antichrist. Obama's the Antichrist. The Pope's the Antichrist. I'm just saying it takes time to raise to prominence, okay? I don't believe Barack Obama is the Antichrist, but he was a senator before he was president. You understand what I'm saying? It takes time to rise to power. Now, this word for bow is the same word that is taken from Genesis 9.13, but that wasn't a scripture that was talking about a bow as an archery, was it? No, that was talking about a rainbow. God's covenant to never destroy the earth again. 
We know that the Antichrist is going to come in and establish a peace contract. Maybe this bow isn't exactly what we think it is. In fact, there is a multifaceted picture that is revealed to us in both the Hebrew and the Greek. In Hebrew, the word is kasheth. In Greek, the word is toxon. It is a weapon, but it is in both languages. It is, it is also the word for rainbow. Now, we know that in our culture today, the rainbow has been co-opted, hasn't it? It is no longer a sign of God's covenant. It is a sign of a false unity that Christians are expected to come under, lest they be intolerant, right? And we all know God loves sinners, but God hates the violation of the intended order that is homosexuality doesn't mean he doesn't love homosexuals. It means that the sin is ungodly. No more so ungodly than adultery. No more so ungodly than lying, cheating. Because the Bible says you break one part of the law, you're guilty of breaking it all. And there's grace because of Jesus Christ. Praise God, there's grace because of Jesus Christ right now. But isn't it interesting that the rainbow could be what's in sight here? The very flag, the very banner that is currently being touted right now, is being carried by this horse that is a false Christ, a false deception of peace. And he conquers with a bow, either a weapon or a rainbow in his hand. Now, what is interesting is that word in Greek, toxon, that literally is the root of where we get our word toxin. It literally, isn't it interesting that what God meant to give us assurance becomes something that becomes poison. Interesting picture. Interesting picture. Daniel 8, 25, speaking of the prince who shall come, says, through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He will use their prosperity to destroy them. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. But he shall be broken without human means. It's not an AK-47 or a Glock 9 millimeter or a surface-to-air missile that takes this guy out. It is not human means that removes him from the world stage. There are a lot of titular allusions to the Antichrist from at least 33 in the Old Testament and 13 in the New Testament. He has titles like the seed of the serpent, the idle shepherd. Some of your Bibles will say the worthless shepherd, but the actual word in the Hebrew in Zechariah there is idle. The little horn, that's a big one. The prince that shall come, the willful king. The one who comes in his own name, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the lawless one, Abaddon, Apollyon, the beast, and the vine of the earth are but a few. What do we know about this guy? What are his characteristics? Well, Daniel 7, 20, 8, 23, Ezekiel 28 call him an intellectual genius. Other scriptures call him a pervasive or a persuasive orator. Other scriptures demonstrate him to be a shrewd politician. He's demonstrated throughout both the Old and New Testaments to be a financial genius, a forceful military leader, a powerful organizer, and a unifying religious guru. And you can trace those down for yourself. There's only one scripture, however, that actually seems to give us a physical description of the Antichrist. That's Zechariah 11, 17, it says, Woe to the, again, idol, as an idolatry, shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. So, you know, um, I haven't heard anybody postulate that David Crenshaw is the Antichrist because I don't think he is. Uh, but you know, they, they may look a little bit alike. David Crenshaw is a good guy. I don't, I don't think that's the case. But what I'm telling you is there does seem to be some hallmarks that saints who are still around on the earth when they see this guy 
will be able to recognize what he looks like. He's got a problem with his right hand. He's got a problem with his right eye. You would think that if you were a diligent student of the Bible, you'd go, oh yeah, I'm not voting for his party. You know, but again, let's talk about the second seal. Conflict on the earth. That's what begins to take place. So what begins with great deception leads to great turmoil. Revelation 6, 3 through 4. When he, the lamb, opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, again, where is this taking place? On the earth. How do we know? Because the living creature is telling him, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Now notice, to take peace from the earth kind of implies that there will be a peaceful season on the earth in order for peace to be removed from the earth. And there was given to him a great sword. So what do we know about this second rider, the rider on the red horse? Well, the second seal brings forth war and a yearning for peace. Why? Because ultimately the one who shall come, he ushers in a peaceful covenant. He ends the wars. It causes, some, you know, I've seen a lot of memes lately that say, boy, people are willing to trade security for peace. How do, you take how do you take power? You remove people's security and then they give you their liberty in exchange for peace. Patriots don't do that, but sheep do. So red is associated with terror and death. We see the red dragon, truly fearful beast, who we know is whom? Satan. In Revelation 12, 3. And in Revelation 17, 3, we see a harlot atop a red beast. So red, symbolically, is always terror. <coughs> Interestingly, though, it may go deeper. Because red is also associated with Israel's ancient enemy from Edom. Meaning Israel's brothers the descendants of Esau, and I'm just going to show you this in Genesis 25. I don't think I have the scripture here, but I still want to point it out to you. Yeah. So Genesis 25, 25, when Esau was born, one of the twins born to um, Isaac, it says, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Red has always had something to do with Esau and Edom, of course, the descendants of Edom, the Idumeans in the Greek, the Edomites in the Old Testament, they today are the Arab race. And that is why there is what is called the eternal hatred, the everlasting hatred of Arab states against Israel, this ongoing battle that God predicted would happen from the descendants of Esau and the descendants of Israel. It is possible, therefore... That the source of these wars, despite the peace agreements that we've seen in recent months and all of those things, are a renewed, hot conflict in the Middle East. Okay? The word for sword used here is makaria in the Greek. We see it in various places. It is a weapon capable of devastating destruction. Matthew 24, 22 says, And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. I want you to pause for a second, because if you go back and you read a lot of the commentaries, you've got to realize a lot of the commentators on um, books like Revelation, some of them go all the way back 400, 500 years. Some of them go back to the Civil War. It is hard to imagine... It's even hard to imagine prior to World War II and the advent of the nuclear bomb a level of destruction 
that could cause no flesh to be saved. Bayonets and muskets, it's hard to kill everybody on the planet. It's going to take a long time. Okay? But there are four developments. Genetics, robotics, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence that have seemed like science fiction, but right now are on the cusp of technological fruition. And nations around the world are using technologies for like this in pursuit of achieving something that for us, even today, we think about it and, and it will seem like fancy because really what they're trying to achieve is a super soldier. They're trying to achieve soldiers that don't cost human life, that fight longer and stronger and need less nutrition, that are designed to be able to maybe not leap tall buildings with a single bound, but destroy in ways that we could never imagine before, taking war to an entirely different level. I don't know if you've ever seen some of these quadrupedic robots that like Boston Dynamics and stuff are coming out. You can kick them and they, they, they will gyroscopically right themselves. I've watched them stand up on their hind legs and backflip onto very narrow platforms. The ability in, in many of these cases, the technologies that we're having, unprecedented. And when all combined with machines that can think, no, I'm not saying that Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to come back naked and steal some biker's outfit and destroy our lives, but I am suggesting that we are racing toward a level of warfare, let's face it, we have not had a conflict with all of our modern technology that has been on the scale of, of the type of conflict we had in World War II. A World War III or a World War IV type contra conflict where weapons of mass destruction don't necessarily put the front line at risk because they can control it from an Xbox controller in a bunker somewhere from out the world. It removes... The fear, and when the fear is removed, the destruction can increase. You understand what I'm saying? So there's a lot of different things that can raise war. Biological weapons have never been unleashed on a, on a large scale. Nuclear weapons have never been unleashed on a large scale. And an EMP detonated several miles out into international waters could still reduce America to life as it existed in the 19th century, like that. The wars that are being described as coming could alter the global landscape, not in months, but literally in weeks or days. And we've just never seen it happen in most of our lifetimes. I won't pontificate beyond that. Let's talk about this third seal. The third seal is scarcity on the earth. And it is not hard to imagine <clears throat> that if war like that breaks out, that scarcity becomes a very real thing. One, one other thing that I want to state, I was reading. You know what? I'll hold that one for a minute. Revelation 6.5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. What is that talking about? Those are some pretty old school terms. Well, the third seal, the rider on the black horse, brings forth famine. And while the war brought a yearning for peace, this horse will bring a yearning for security. Black is often connected with famine in the Bible. Lamentations 4, 4 through 8 5, 10, Jeremiah 14, 1 through 2. 
especially written in times when Israel was under siege by the Babylonians. The word in the Greek there, koinix, is a dry measure containing four koitulai or two sitari. What that means is it's less than one quart or one liter is about the measurement that we're talking about here. Okay? Or as much as would support a man of moderate appetite for a single day. So, one man's appetite for a single day, or as the Greek author Herodotus said, it gives this amount that the Bible is referencing here in Greek as consumed by each soldier in the army of the Persian king Xerxes every day. So it's one man's food, right? A denarius, according to Matthew 20, verse 2, 9 through 11, is a day's wage. So in other words, this time of famine and scarcity on the earth, what you work for in a day, all you can buy with that is what it takes to feed you, not your family, just you in a day. So it becomes impossible to get ahead. It becomes impossible to achieve prosperity. It becomes impossible to thrive. Because all of your effort goes into your belly. And then you have to repeat it the next day and the next day. Now, the oil in the wine is an interesting, interesting concept here. In our culture, and I find this very ironic, this is an expression, it's a Hebraic expression, oil and wine, it would equate to, say, toiletries. In other words, what John is telling us here, when the scarcity comes, he's basically saying that there will be great hoarding of <clears throat> toilet paper. The luxuries of life. The things that make life nice. This is more than just famine alone. It describes rationing and control of goods. We saw just a sampling of this at the beginning of the lockdowns in 2020. Don't think that it can't happen. The coming world leader will control the economy. In 1923, Germany, the cost of goods doubled every four days. In 1944, Greece, they doubled every four days. In 1946, Hungary, food prices doubled every 15 hours. We've also seen government-engineered famines even more recently. In 1982 in Mexico, the inflation rate hit 10,000%, driving the price of food up 100 times in 12 months. Don't tell me it can't happen quickly. We've seen it happen quickly in our lifetime. In 1989, Argentina, the peso was devalued three times, driving up food prices by 3,079% in a single year. In 1994, Brazil, inflation raged at 2,075.8% per year, making food more than 20 times more expensive. In 1994, Yugoslavia, food prices doubled every 34 hours. And in 2008, Zimbabwe, they doubled every single day. 2008. It brings to mind a Spanish proverb. And that Spanish proverb is civilization and anarchy are seven meals apart. Civilization and anarchy are seven meals apart. Look at Amos 8, 11. It said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now again, I want you to understand, 
if the pre-tribulationist rapture strategy is true and the church is eva evacuated from the earth, including the indwelling Holy Spirit of God that was the bride price paid to the bride, the restrainer that the New Testament talks about being moved out of the way so the lawless one can arise. Where does the famine begin? Does it begin with the deception? Does it begin with the war? Does it begin with the scarcity on the earth? Or does it begin because there is no one preaching the truth? And civilization is seven meals of the bread of life away from utter destruction. You understand what I'm saying? It's the only way that it makes sense. Because if the church is still there, we're still fighting. What is the force that is keeping socialism from taking over America today? It's the church. Remove the church, the country can slide into socialism, communism, and everything else. People who don't see that, I just don't understand. So Amos prophesies the true source of the famine. Let's look at the fourth and last seal that we're going to look at this morning. Widespread death on the earth. Revelation 6, 7 says, When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked and behold, a pale green or livid horse. And the name of him who sat on it, this is the only horse whose name we get. And the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hades followed with him. And power was given to them, notice that's plural, over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. I want to pull a few things out in that. One, the fourth rider is not one, two, one people, but two, death and Hades. Second, did you read what it said? And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth. 25% of the population of the planet. When this seal opens. Do you not think by the, by the time the wars have have ended by the time the famine has killed who it's going to kill, whoever's left gets wiped out by 25% of this fourth seal that people will be ready to accept anybody that will bring them peace. <clears throat> so let's discuss the rider on this green horse. This fourth seal brings, oh, I'm sorry. This four, fourth horse brings forth disease, that should say. Green. Interestingly enough, green in the Bible is a color used to describe leprosy. And what is leprosy in the Bible? It is the incurable disease. And when you see what this word actually means, the word in the Greek is chloros. It means a green, yellowish, or pale. It is the word from which we get chlorine. How do we try to kill disease? Anybody? What have, what have all of our goals been when it comes to disinfect everything? What's been sold off of shelves for months? Clorox bleach. Isn't it amazing that the Bible even has inside of it these... I mean, when in... The 1500s, would this have made as much sense as it makes now? I'm not making this stuff up. In Leviticus, we see it as the color of leprosy. So this is about disease. And two personages are in view. Death claims the body. But Hades is the real brat because she claims the soul. John saw these enemies going forth to claim their prey, armed with the weapons of the sword, hunger, pestilence, and wild beasts. And here's something that you need to think about. Not all beasts walk around on four legs. Some of the most deadly beasts on our planet 
are invisible to the naked eye. Ebola is a deadly beast. Biological entities that are targeted to specific genomes are a deadly beast. And the hints in that word, that color, suggests to me that maybe disease is unleashed on the world in ways that will make COVID-19 look like a day at the beach. Another thing that was interesting to me, I was reading, and for years, scientists have been trying to use petroleum-eating bacteria to clean up oil spills. It happened at the British Petroleum thing that happened in the Gulf a while back. Um, but some scientists have said, you know, this could be bad because we could invent a strain of um, bacteria that eats oil. It could get into the reserves and it could wipe out global economies because petroleum and all things that are petroleum based could be destroyed by a microbe. There's an interesting fictional book upon it that it plunges the world into economic chaos because petroleum is destroyed by an infestation of a microbe that eats it. One of our creations run amok. Food for thought. Ezekiel 14.21 says, For thus says the Lord God, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem. What are they? Sword and famine and wild beast and pestilence. Isn't it amazing how Ezekiel gets that right hundreds of years between John writing the apocalypse? To cut off man and beast from it. Ezekiel 18.23 says, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. Verse 30, therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Do not forget that these judgments, as Israel is afflicted and the world is afflicted with them, are to get them to turn. One last attempt to get them to acknowledge the Messiah so that he can return and judge sin on the earth forever. These judgments are still to get them to turn. They're still to get them to repent. Look at the song sung to God in Revelation 15, 3, because I understand talks like this can be depressing. It says, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Verse 4 says, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. These manifest judgments are to get the world to worship. Revelation 16, 5. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. Six and seven, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Remember, the dispensation of grace is over. But my friends, I don't want to end this session in a place of discouragement. Revelation contains a great hope. We're just on our way there. Do you know what the great hope is? There's not just four horsemen. There are five. Behold, a fifth horseman stands ready to ride. You see, because Jesus is the true rider of a white horse. He's not the deceiver. He's not a false Christ. The final horseman is ready to ride, but he doesn't mount up until Revelation 
It says, now I saw a heaven open and behold a white horse. But John wasn't deceived. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Israel repents. Jesus returns to the earth. And those that persecuted the saints, those that martyr the tribulation saints, those that persecute Israel, they finally are judged as God goes to war with the sin in the world one last time. My friends, every time you're in the book of Revelation and it seems dark, don't forget the fifth horseman's about to ride. Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your truth. We thank you that even as we study what will be undoubtedly dark times in the future, that you, you have a plan to redeem it all. I pray that you've given everybody in this audience words to hear, or ears to hear, a heart to listen, indelibly mark it upon their souls. Amen. Let me show you your homework, and we'll dismiss. Your homework for the week, and you actually have two weeks because we're going to do something special next week while the reporters are here. Review the Jewish wedding model session from our rapture series. Review the evidences for a gap between rapture and great tribulation worksheet that I gave you today or that you can link to online. Read Revelation 6, 9 through 17. Of the temple furnishings, what altar are the martyrs of the fifth seal under? That's your assignment. Answer that question. Where in the temple was the altar located? In the outer court, in the holy place, or in the holy of holies? Answer that question. And then read Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14, and answer this. Where is the bride in that parable? Talks a lot about wedding guests. Talks a lot about the bridegroom. Talks a lot about the father of the bride. Where's the bride? When I was studying the word yesterday, God showed me that chapter in a way I have never seen it, in a way that is different than I taught it when we did our Matthew commentary. Both are true, but again, fourfold Hebrew hermeneutics are going to come to the rescue. Lastly, why are the guests judged whether or not they are worthy? Answer that question. And with that, you are loved, you are dismissed. The offerings in the back, please be cheerful givers or give online. Go with God. We will see you next week.